Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to Insider Guides webinars. This is uh, not actually a webinar, this is a, 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 an industry chat. We're gonna do a few of these where we intersperse the webinars with one-on-ones with uh, really interesting people. Uh, and uh, you know, we've got here today, David Bycroft, who is the founder of the Australian Homestay Network. We've got David on a call today because industry experts are telling us that we can expect thousands of homeless international students in the next few months. And that's not a good thing. And these are students that have lost their part-time jobs. They can no longer afford rent. And while there is a rent moratorium in place, there's also a range of loopholes uh, that means students can still be evicted. For example, if you're a, a flatmate living in a share house who isn't, who's not on the head lease and what, what, what's going to happen next to them. But I wanted to talk to David because his team has launched uh, the International Student Support Network where the community is encouraged to open up their homes and take on international student tenants in like a homestay capacity at a discounted rate. And uh, so, yeah, David, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, James. Can you tell us a little bit about what, uh, about the evolution of the Australian Homestay Network uh, from arranging hosting asylum seekers in 2012 to now providing support for international students during uh, COVID-19. Yeah, so a lot of people will remember 2012 when we had a lot of asylum seekers in the detention centres and many more coming. So we put our hand up and worked with the Department of Immigration and were able to get asylum seekers out of detention and into homestay as a partial solution to um, easing the problem in the detention centres, number one, but also finding the asylum seekers a safe, warm, welcoming place to live that had meals, networks and mentor. And, and we watched that work really well. So when we saw this emerging problem for international students, we thought that's exactly what we need now, low cost accommodation. Well, yeah, it sounds like a, a very timely solution. And you know, we had Phil Honeywood on the on the phone uh, on the webinar just a few days ago, who was talking about this exact issue of what will happen if students aren't looked after. So we are hearing from both students and industry contacts that there will be homeless international students expected to be evicted. How will our Australian Homestead Network actually be able to support these students? Yeah, so we, over the years, we've been placing roughly 60,000 international students in what we call normal homestay arrangements. But the beauty of homestay is that you get a person with a room, you have meals included generally, and then this product that we've designed for uh, our, our program to help solve this problem, we are making sure meals are included. We also make sure that they don't have to spend their own money because they're living in a household where the electricity is paid, the internet is paid, that, you know, like we're trying to get a package together where they can basically uh, be part of a host family or a host and be part of that infrastructure, which gives them companionship as well. So we just think it's potentially the best solution for many students who are struggling. The, the, the trick for us is to find the hosts who will do it at lower prices. But we, when we launched the Asylum Seeker program in 2012, we had 5,000 applications in two months of Australians who were genuinely interested in helping someone out who had a problem. Wow, so 5,000, that's quite a lot. Do you, do you think you'll have that same level of demand now? Well, the, the, I don't think it will be as large because of the, the shutdown issues that are happening in Australia and other parts of the world. But we still have that database of 5,000 who put their hand up for the asylum seekers. So next week we'll be writing to those people and saying, hey, Houston, we have another problem and we, we, we need some help with international students now. So we're hoping those people are still out there and realising that the student's only one step away from an asylum seeker at the moment, and we just need to get them back activated. So we, we hope to activate a, a proportion of those and take some of the pressure off the industry. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a great initiative. Obviously, it's a bit frightening that we've reached this point where, as you're saying, that you know they're, they're actually not, not too far away from feeling... Uh, like an asylum seeker, sort of in, in that state of limbo. Uh, let's talk about pricing. How much does it cost for a student to, uh, well, who, who, yeah, who's actually paying for this and how much does a student uh, have to pay to, to do this? 
Well, we, we've had education providers contact us already who are willing to pay because they're receiving funding to try to help students out who are in need. So that, that's a positive. Um, the students who can't afford commercial uh, arrangements are at least going to see this come down to, a, we think about $160 per week with meals included. So that there's no bond to pay, there's a four week uh, minimum, but we will vary that for different situations. So we're looking to be on a case by case and, and our company will oversee the whole arrangement. It will come with all of our insurances, all of our network supports, and the host should feel pretty comfortable that they're well supported and the student. And I'll just add, we give the student updates all the time about social distancing, school closures, like we're always staying in touch with what they need to know. Uh, some of these students are at various levels uh, in, their, in their problem right now. Are there short-term options, long-term options? How we, how's that gonna work? Yeah, we're, we're looking to try to uh, fit in with each case and individualise it. So if there was an emergency um, overnighter or three-nighter or five nights, we would be looking for hosts that have put their hand up and just saying, look, we've got somebody, it's not going to be for a long term and they just need help right now for this next week and then they fly home or they've got something organised with the school. So, so we, we are treating it on a case-by-case -case basis. But because we think that this um, current restrictions are going to be in place for at least another four weeks and maybe much longer, um, we want to try to get the students settled and we know from experience that we want at least a four week placement to see how that goes. And it could end up being a much longer term placement because everybody's happy. Wow, so it really is a matter now of just finding families who are going to open their doors now. So, I mean, one of the things about managed student accommodation is they do get that level of controlled support. Uh, can you tell us about the support that AHN would, would provide to a student who's going through this process? Yeah, look, our, our team is experienced, as I said, and we have people in every major education location in Australia. So, you know, first up is, first we've got to find the host. So once we can find the host, we do the host training to make sure they're on par with what we're doing. Um, we make sure that the placement is properly insured just in case some liability issue occurs. We also make sure that the student is welcomed properly and, and that's really important. And once the student is settling, we stay in connection with both the host and student during that placement where either can call us if they have any concern and one of our trained and experienced operators who is local will be able to help them from our experience of 60,000 placements, there's not much we haven't seen. So we basically are looking to try to help them manage through any early stages of uh, relationship issues or understanding dishwashers or fridges or anything that might go wrong. So, so we're used to that. And, and once you get through those first few weeks, usually it's a very, very settled, comfortable and happy arrangement, which will also reduce the mental health potential issues that will come out of this current situation. Yeah, and that's a that's a good point. I mean, we've seen, I've had students contact me. We had a, a webinar yesterday with the Fair Work Ombudsman where we had uh, over a thousand students on in, inside it and they were talking about some of the issues relating to mental health, uh, about losing their jobs and things like that. So these are these are going to get more pronounced as we, as we move through this. Uh, what about the host families in terms of support for them? Yeah, so the hosts get the same sort of approach. So we, we uh, value our uh, hosts first. So we make sure that not everybody who applies will get selected as a host. They have to be in a reasonable location for uh, the student to start with. They also have to be uh, of the right culture to work with us to solve the problem. And that's why we've isolated this program. We will only attract the people who are doing it for the right reason and not for the money. So by getting those people sorted, and, and we learned this during the Asylum Seeker program, you actually get a far better experience for the student and you get a host who's willing to learn as much as we can help them with and then contact us if they need a hand with anything but it, it's rarely a complaint about the money or the food. It's, it's more of how do I do this in this situation? Um, you know, and, and we, we've had the experience to be able to handle that. 
So hosts will get full support. In fact, we want to work with education providers who, who need help for their students to try to find hosts in their own local network pool as well. So that we want to find people who want to do this for the right reason and want to be part of the solution rather than sitting at home perhaps wondering what to do. So this will help fill their day having a guest who can help them um, you know, interact with another culture. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, I can certainly see the benefits there, but obviously, you know, we need to have a good vetting process. What's the vetting process like to find the right host? So we, yeah. So first up, they have to apply and they, you know, then we go through a process of police clearances first for, for um, Australian um, security checks. And we also make sure they've done an online training program before we then do an interview. Now, normally we do interviews in the home, but we've changed that for this period where we, we do the Zoom interview or the, the Skype interview. And we make sure we go through a process so that one of our trained uh, host inspectors has said this person would be really good. Now, again, when we did the Asylum Seeker program, we had a far better quality host pools coming through because they knew what they were walking into. Uh, low fees and potentially a, a person with a problem. Mm. So those people are genuine usually, so they pass the host criteria really quickly and then we have a room available and we can turn all of that around in a matter of a week or two from when we first engage. Yeah, I just I was thinking about this the other day because um, when when the Prime Minister had made those comments the other week about how international students should go home if they can't support themselves, I did see a whole, well, a large part of the community come out on social media saying, well, hold on a second, we don't necessarily agree with that approach. And there was this lovely sense of humanity that came out uh, from people who wanted to genuinely help uh, international students and foreign workers who are left high and dry. So. Um, yeah, it sounds like it, you, this could definitely be a really good approach. But are, are you, um, I mean, what might happen though in a circumstance where a host family is actually no longer able to accommodate this student for a, a range of reasons? They've, um, you know, they themselves contract coronavirus or, uh, yeah. or they've lost their own job or something like that. So again, we've, we've been used to handling these situations with the volume of normal homestay placements that we've made so that we would, would expect from this process to have a whole lot of hosts available um, in, in any region where there is a significant population around an education provider, for instance. So, so that we, we always have a two week notice uh, period required so that that gives us time to first settle everyone down if there's any issue, but second, to make sure that we've got an alternate option for the student and, and we see ourselves working very closely with education providers on this and, and um, also the study, various study groups around the states, you know, to, to make sure that we're working hand in hand as problems arise. Mm, okay. Are you, I mean, obviously there's some students who, who uh, are left in a situation where they may not be with an institution anymore or they may have to, um, they're not sure how their institution is really supporting them. Uh, how, how are you getting to the students to tell them about this? Are you, uh, are, you, are you only taking students that have been referred by an institution or provider or are you working open to working directly with the students themselves? Yeah, we, we worked on this fairly uh, heavily over Easter actually to get the selection criteria and how we're working it. There will also be, we suspect there will be more demand than supply, even though we're going to do our best to activate a large host network. Uh, we agree with you that there's going to be, many, as time goes on, there's going to be many more students affected by this than perhaps uh, the industry can handle. So that we're trying to get ahead of it and try to build enough hosts so that there will be a lot of options for people. Um, if someone can't afford it, we would have to work with the education provider, the government, and try to get the minimum fees we need for that transaction to occur. Um, we, we, we don't believe we'll be putting anyone out on the streets. Yeah. Yes, I really hope that the federal government does create this hardship fund for this exact reason, because then I can see a situation where those institutions get some of those funds and, and do things like this and actually help these students directly by supporting them and putting them in homestay. If we talk about, well, you look, uh, yeah, sorry, you go. 
So I was just going to say, well, you know, the reality is you're looking at a package. Now, there, there is a small placement fee for the organisation up front, but we've halved that. It's about $150 to get a placement. But when you look at the four-week program or the, or the price per week, you're talking about um, less than um, $25 a day, including three meals, accommodation, electricity, internet, and having a friend that you're living with that knows uh, all of the things they need to know to help you feel settled. So it, it's probably one of the best packages ever seen for an international student. Right, well, if we talk about this in the context of the entire accommodation sector for international students in Australia, there's so many different things that are happening right now. We, we, we heard from, uh, we heard from, uh, Study New South Wales the other day that that they that the federal government was considering basically pushing all students in residential colleges out on the street uh, because it was considered a non-essential service having a residential college. Uh, how do you feel that this sector can best support international students right now? Yeah, so the reason we've called this program the International Student Support Network is because we plan on joining groups like yours, James, and saying, hey, be part of this. Let's, let's all drive this because the more hosts that we can get right now, the less problems we will have when and if government make decisions that put more pressure on the industry. Hopefully, we've got great people stopping bad decisions being made at government level, but, but we don't control that. So right now, we believe we've got a chance to build enough rooms to take a lot of pressure off the current situation. And we want it to be a network approach. I, I've already had um, discussions with groups like SCAPE, who I know uh, are also interested in solving problems. And we would hope that when we ran out of supply, we might be able to have arrangements similar with other providers who have empty rooms and just, you know, find a solution for each student as, it, as we can uh, see fit. But it, it's not a small project. We've done this before with asylum seekers. There's a lot more hand-holding in this project than um, you know, any other typical accommodation placement. So we're going to need to work closely with government, industry, education providers, even education agents, and, and just say, okay, you're all part of the International Student Support Network. Uh, we're not a corporation, it's just a brand, but we're wanting to use that brand and have members say we're part of that, you know, and just say let's let's push and let's push hard. That's right. So, I mean, we are well and truly in this together. And, uh, yeah, I think the sector, certainly from what I can see, the sector's doing a very good job of, of galvanising into one con a very strong sense of support is really coming through and uh, it's fantastic to see. Obviously, we're in challenging times, but... Uh, yeah, look, I mean, that's fantastic to hear all this information and, uh, and I think the sector would be really curious to hear about it. So uh, thanks so much for your time, David. Yeah, and we'd, we'd be happy to hear from anybody that wants to find out more information and we'll send a release out so that people can find what they need to know. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks.